All right, today in this lecture, we're going to go over the earliest fossil hominins. We'll talk about the pre australopithecines also called the basal hominins. We'll also talk about the gracile australopithecines, the robust australopithecines, known as paranthropus. And we will briefly talk about early members of genus Homo in the lab class. They include genus hom early genus Homo in this unit, and we will briefly talk about it today. So let's talk first about the pre-Australopithecines. You may also see them called the basal hominins. The date range for these species between 6 million years ago and 4 million years ago. Um, there's a feature called post-orbital constriction. So this is going to be the constriction behind the brow. And in a moment, we'll go over to the fossils, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by post-orbital constriction. We'll look at the degree of zygomatic flare, the zygomatic bones of the cheekbones. Uh, these are what we call habitual or part-time bipeds, meaning that when on the ground or standing on tree branches, they were bipedal, but they also retain the ability to brachiate in the trees and essentially retain some degree of arboreal locomotion. So they're bipedal part of the time and arboreal the other part of the time. So some of the fossils we'll talk about, uh, Salanthropus chagensis, also known as Chadman, Artophysicus ramidus, also known as Artie, and Orion tugenensis. And then we're going to move over here to what we call the gracile australopithecines, or just the australopithecines. So these date anywhere from about 4 million years ago to 2.5 million years ago. They also have post-orbital constriction. That's how it sinks in behind the brow. They will have a medium degree of zygomatic flare. They are also habitual or part-time bipeds. Their cranial capacity is relatively small, around 400 to 500 cc's. That's within the range of what you would see in modern day chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans. Uh, some of the fossils we'll look at, or the species we'll talk about, Australopithecus afarensis, uh, the Lucy fossil, goes within this genus and species. Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus sediba, and also Australopithecus gari. Um, Sediba and Gari are somewhat significant since, based upon their date and some of their anatomical features, they may be the most recent direct ancestor of genus Homo. Of course, this is debated. Um, Sediba does have a very mosaic anatomy, indicating definitely habitual bipedalism, not obligate bipedalism yet. And Gari also has some evidence that they possibly used and made old one stone tools. There is not direct evidence, but there are antelope bones that show cut marks that are characteristic of old one tools. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment, but that's why these two are somewhat significant. And the next group is the robust Australopithecines, and their genus is Paranthropus. So their date range, and they coexisted with the gracile forms, their date range goes about 2.5 to about 1.2 million years ago for most of these species. They have a very extreme degree of post-orbital constriction. They also have an extreme degree of zygomatic flare and a very prominent sagittal crest. So these features, the zygomatic flare and the sag sagittal crest are related to very powerful chewing muscles, low quality diet. They used a lot of chewing pressure to chew, to, uh, chew vegetation and possibly harder food items like tubers and nuts. Um, they had a very specialized diet their specialized diet may be the reason for their ultimate demise. They were focused then mainly on rough, tough vegetation, whereas the gracile forms and also later on genus Homo had a much more varied, generalized diet. So, you know, in evolution, the more variety, the more diversity, the more adaptable you are. So it's very possible that the diet of the gracile forms simply made them more adaptable. Uh, cranial capacity for the gracile forms, about 400 to 500 cc's. Cranial capacity for the robust forms gets a little bit bigger, about 400 to 550 cc's, but all in all, still very small, still within the range of what we would see in modern day apes. So some of the fossil examples we'll look at are Paranthropus boisei, nickname is the Nutcracker Man, and also the Black Skull. And then if you're in the lab class, they also include early members of genus Homo within this same unit, and those of us in lecture will go into Homo habilis more deeply next week our next lecture. So Homo habilis dates between about two and a half to 1.8 million years old. Some of the changes that we're going to see is post-orbital constriction is going to decrease. So that means essentially the brain is starting to get larger, especially the frontal region of the brain is starting to get larger. We see a decrease in zygomatic flare. 
we see an overall more rounded globular cranial shape. Uh, there's pretty solid evidence that they definitely utilize what we call Oldowan stone tool technology, very basic stone tools used for scavenging, and these are also called lower paleolithic tools. Uh, cranial capacity, we are going to see a jump, um, a slight jump. We don't see a major jump really until we get to Homo erectus that we'll talk about in the next lecture, but it is notable that we do see a slight increase in cranial capacity, about 500 to 600 cc's for Homo habilis. So now we're going to head over here to the skull. So this first one we have over here is Solanthropus chagensis, known as Chadman. So when you turn the skull over so you can look at the superior view or view from above, the postorbital constriction, essentially how far it sinks in behind the brow, you can see there's a fairly extreme degree of constriction, meaning that the cranial capacity is relatively small. Uh, the supraorbital ridge or the brow ridge is fairly prominent in Solanthropus. We don't have the zygomatic bones, the cheekbones. We can see that there may have possibly been a sagittal crest here as well. So this one here is cranial capacity of about 350 to 380 cc's, so it's still relatively small. And then we're going to move on to Artipithecus rhamidus, or Arti. So we're going to turn it this way, look at the superior view. So we see again there's a pretty fairly extreme degree of postorbital constriction. Zygomatic flare is also, I'd say, medium to extreme. And when you look at, look at a view from the front, you can see that overall face looks more ape-like. We also have a slightly more pronounced canine. And we have, when we turn it to the side, so we're looking at a lateral view, that we can see that there's a degree of prognathism. So prognathism is talking about how far does the mid-face and jaw jut forward. So more prognathic is more ape-like, less prognathic is more human-like. And then we move on down, we're getting into our gracile australopithecines here, or just the true australopithecines. So our first one is Australopithecus afarensis, nickname is Lucy. So we turn it over, look at the superior view. We can see that there is, I'd say, a medium degree of constriction. It's not quite as extreme as Artipithecus, but there is definitely still, still some constriction here behind the brow. We can see there's a medium degree of zygomatic flare. When we turn the skull to the side, we can see that there is some prognathism, more ape-like than human-like. When we turn it around and look at the posterior view, we can see that the widest point is down here at the base. And the gracile forms are not going to have a sagittal crest, so they do not have the bony mohawk running down the center. And then another example of the gracile forms would be Australopithecus africanus. So when you turn the skull over, look at the superior view, there is still some constriction behind the, the brow. It's not quite as extreme as some of the earlier ones, but there is definitely still some constriction. We see, see that there is still some degree of zygomatic flare. We turn the skull to the side, looking at the lateral view, we see there's still some prognathism, probably not as much prognathism as some of the earlier forms, but it's still there. And then Africanus also has kind of a more human-like, slightly more rounded globular shape to the skull. And then now we're going to move down here to the robust Australopithecines. The genus is Paranthropus. So this first one is Paranthropus boisei, nicknamed the Nutcracker. So a very distinctive looking skull here. When you turn it over, look at the superior view or view from above. You see that we definitely have an extreme degree of constriction behind the brow ridge. We have a sagittal crest, which I like to call the bony mohawk running down the center. Uh, so essentially the sagittal crest is the attachment point for the jaw muscles. So the jaw muscles are going to start here at the ramus, tuck underneath the zygomatic bone, and then they attach all the way up here at the sagittal crest. So whenever you see features like a sagittal crest, really massive jaw, massive molars, that indicates that that primate or that human consumed a diet of very rough, tough, uh, low quality vegetation. So they had to chew quite a bit of it and use quite a bit of jaw force to get enough calories for the day. Uh, Paranthropus boisei also has a very concave face. Um, when you look at it from the front, you can even see the zygomatic flare, but of course when you turn it this way from the superior view, you can really see the extreme degree of zygomatic flare. You can see from the side that Paranthropus also has prognathism. And when you look at it from the back, 
from the posterior view, you can see that the widest point is, at, point is down here at the base. And then just another example of the robust forms, this one is called the black skull. So you can see, again, a very distinctive looking fossil. This one definitely has a very prominent sagittal crest, indicating a diet of low quality food items, rough tough vegetation. Looking at the superior view, you can see the high or extreme degree of postorbital constriction. You can see the extreme degree of zygomatic flare, and also pretty extreme degree of prognathism as well. And then you turn it around and look at it from the back, widest point is still down here at the base. And we bring that up because later on when we start looking at genus Homo, we're going to see the widest point of the skull slightly move up as we go through time, as cranial capacity expands, postorbital constriction will begin to decrease, and the widest point of the skull will move up higher on the cranium. So that is the conclusion of the basal hominins, the Australopithecines, and Paranthropus.